Greetings everyone and welcome to this mini lecture on hegemony and popular culture. So in this mini lecture we're going to take a look at hegemony and its role in popular culture, its influence in popular culture uh, to understand I think one of the big things that this can help explain or make sense of is how things change within popular culture or how popular culture helps to affect change. So this idea of hegemony comes from a theorist called Antonio Gramsci, Gramsci, and I always butcher that name, I apologize. Um, and his, his thought here was that culture's continual struggle back and forth between ruling elite and underclasses, uh, that we see this happening constantly throughout history. And Dominic Stranati, who I've talked about before, says this about hegemony, that cultural and ide it's the cultural and ideological means whereby the dominant groups in society, including fundamentally but not exclusively the ruling class, maintain their dominance by securing the spontaneous consent of the subordinate groups, including the working class. This is achieved by the negotiated construction of a political and ideological consensus, which incorporates both dominant and dominated groups. And so th what this talks about is rather than straight out class conflict that we see come from people like Marx or Marxism, here it's saying that doesn't happen. There is tension, but that tension is usually assuaged through negotiation through an attempt to construct some things that placate or make the dominated groups less angry or potentially violent. So this is how it works. The ruling class compromises, right? They say, okay, we hear that people are upset about X, Y, and Z. The ruled class accepts to various degrees. They might not accept, not everybody is going to accept, but enough of them, a critical mass of them is going to accept so that it then doesn't become something explosive. And that change occurs, but often not substantial change, enough to be marginally inclusive. So a problem arises, the ruling class says, oh, we see that you're upset. Well, here's where we'll compromise. The ruled class says, okay, it's not the big enchilada, but we'll still take it. And something marginally change. It's often not significant enough, but it is a point of progress. And this is one of the, the key pieces here that I think is important compared to other theories and approaches to popular culture is that this does indicate that the popular, you know, the popular masses, the, the ruled class as it were, has some power. They do or are able to negotiate. There is a relationship here that isn't entirely one way, that the ruling class has to compromise, which I think is important to recognize. Um, so where, so, so that ruling class, what we have is that domination and influence comes from intellectual and moral leadership, producers, distributors, and interpreters of culture. So your cultural critics are people who are going to, you know, dictate certain things, your, your, you know, uh, religious leaders, uh, po politicians, all of these people are in ways producers, distributors, and interpreters of culture, right? There's many a time in which a politician or a religious leader really does use popular culture as a means of, you know, or interprets culture, popular culture, as a means of trying to negotiate or argue uh, one way or another. And there's, there's ways in which those things are met in the middle. So, the key piece here is that is this idea that culture is perpetually negotiated. And I think that's a very powerful concept. You know, compared to what we look at with mass culture theory and the like, this is really interesting. It's saying actually people do have power um, and that people do express that, was po that power. And you do see this go back and forth. And, and we see that in a variety of ways. A couple, two really great examples of this are, of course, um, for people that are familiar with Sherlock Holmes. The original Sherlock Holmes uh, short stories and novellas written by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, uh, Doyle at one point kills off Sherlock Holmes. He's just sick of writing about Sherlock Holmes. But the fans, in large, large numbers, just just keep harassing Doyle and Doyle's publishers, saying, we want more Sherlock, we want more Sherlock, Sherlock can't be dead. And sure enough, Doyle brings him back. 
this happened again in the 2000s. There's another great example with the show Family Guy. Family Guy was on television for about two years, and then it was canceled. And as the as Family Guy came out, as the series came out on DVD, and fans really rallied behind, let's get the show back on. And now the show has been running for well over a decade. Um, these are instances in which culture was negotiated, right? The producers and distributors of Family Guy, of Sherlock Holmes, all said, nope, not going to happen. We're canceling it. We're deleting. We're killing off. And the fans came back and said, oh, no, you don't. And so there was something that was negotiated, and those, those characters came back. So a couple other examples worth looking at. Um, the the uh, comics, the, uh, the comic series um, of Archie, for people that are familiar with, one of the things that it had been critiqued by for many is being very, very heterosexual centric. And so one of the things that they've done is introduce a gay character. So again, here's a negotiation. Here's an opportunity to give space to people that want to enjoy but have problems with the... the overwhelmingly strong messages of heterosexuality. Black entertainment television is another great example in which, you know, given the, his the history of entertainment, and in this course we've talked about this before, and the, the misrepresentation of African Americans, okay, well, now there's a channel. Now, there there's problems with this, because I, I've heard it said, and this is, this is shocking, of, you know, why then do they need to be main stars on other places? They have their own station, as if just one station was enough. But this, uh, but the bigger idea within within hegemony is this is something that had to be negotiated. This is something that ha that took a while to produce. It wasn't evident. It wasn't there 20, 30 years ago. The Motion Picture Association of America it comes under a lot of flack about kind of the the decisions it makes. But its ability to rate films allows for a lot more films or different types of films to be made. Um, and back before the the ratings the the rating system came out, there was what was known as the Hayes Code, and the Hayes Code pretty much said, well, if it has X, Y, and Z, it cannot be wide released. It cannot be put in theaters. Whereas the Motion Picture Theater with the Motion Picture Association says, okay, if it has X, Y, or Z, then it's going to get r this rating. If it has A, B, C, it's going to get this rating. And so it was a negotiation. It was an attempt to both respond to, you know, concerns, but also to allow for a wider range of things to be seen and to be addressed. And then finally, and this is one of the more damning ones, uh, or at least potentially damning ones, is um, the environment. So there's been large pushes for recycle and recycling. And that's great. That is a push towards the environment, right? And that was the, that was the step. That was the negotiation of, you know, people saying, nope, not going to spend the time, waste the money, etc. And people saying, actually, this is really important for the environment. And this is where we talk about sometimes the change is a bit superficial. Recycling is a good step but it is extremely considered a baby step in order to address the kind of waste and destruction we're doing to our environment. Um, because recycle still requires a variety of energy, energy used to actually recycle goods, the question about, well, why don't we just hold on to goods and we don't actually you know, have to re-melt them down and, and make new things with them. So these are some examples of the ways in which we can see hegemony working within our culture. And I think there's a lot of others when you start to dig down and look deep, but I think that that important piece of culture is perpetually negotiated is important to remember because it certainly is. And the important piece out of that to remember is this implies that, you know, the, the, you know, the, the larger amount of people the people that engage in popular culture have power. Um, that it is not just the elites who say so. Uh, that they, the, the large, you know, the masses of people have some power. Um, that is, that's a useful idea to know and to work with. All right, that's all for now. Thank you very much for listening, and see you in the next video.